This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the Paradoxical Eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking about um, some other genomes that contribute to what makes us human. So this may look like a photograph of outer space, but these pinpoint points of light are not stars. They are, in fact, the glowing genomes of millions of bacterial cells on the human surface of human teeth. This is dental plaque. <laughs> now, the human body contains an estimated 30 trillion human cells and by the latest estimate, 40 trillion bacterial cells. And so if you add these two numbers up together, you will find that we are more than 50% bacterial. Now, 40 trillion bacterial cells is an incredible number. And at an average length of just over one micron, if you were to line them up, just the ones in your own body alone, end to end, they would actually wrap around the entire Earth and span more than 20,000 miles. 40 trillion bacterial cells is truly an astronomical number, and even this fails to capture the immensity of this number because there are only about 300 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And so the number of bacteria in and on your body actually exceed the number of stars in more than 100 galaxies. So at this point, you may be wondering how you appear human at all, and the answer is that although numerous, these bacteria are also very small. On average, they're a 1,000 times smaller than a human cell, and so when you add them all up together, they make up about 2% of your body weight, or roughly 1.5 kilograms. Now, that's a really interesting number because that's about the same weight as your brain and your liver, and so some have argued that we should start to think of the microbiome as an additional organ system. Now, most of these bacteria are concentrated in the gut, and specifically in the distal colon. And in feces, they're actually concentrated to an extraordinary degree. Um, there are over 100 billion viable bacterial cells per gram of feces. And so if you follow the math through, that means with each trip to the toilet, you actually lose 20% of your total body cells. But don't worry, you regenerate them very quickly after your next meal. Now, in addition to the gut, a smaller but also very important fraction of your microbiome lives within your oral cavity, and there they inhabit the buccal mucosa, the surface of the tongue, and the surfaces of your teeth, where they're called dental plaque. Now, the oral microbiome actually plays a very important role in the history of microbiology, because the first undisputed description of bacteria comes from a letter written by Anthony von Leeuwenhoek to the Royal Society of London approximately 300 years ago, in which he described very many small animals which moved themselves very extravagantly within his dental plaque. Uh, he drew many of these organisms, and he tried to count them, but he eventually gave up, and he wrote, the number of these animals in the scurf of man's teeth are so numerous that I believe they exceed the number of men in a kingdom. 
Now, if anything, this is a gross understatement because we now know that there are nearly as many bacteria on the surface of your teeth as there are humans on Earth, and each day you swallow an average of 80 billion bacteria in your saliva. So in addition to being numerous, uh, these bacteria also contain an immense diversity of genes. And on average, there are about 150 times more genes in your microbiome than in, than in your uh, human genome. Um, this collectoral bacterial genome is so large that it's often referred to as your accessory genome. And in fact, you require these genes in order to perform some of your most basic human life functions. And this has led some to describe the relationship between humans and their microbes as that of a superorganism, like a colony of bees, or many uh, independent uh, organisms contributing together, or um, more recently as a holobiont, an ecosystem so tightly interdependent that it behaves as a single organism, like coral. So rather than just being a leaf on the great tree of life, in some ways humans are actually more like a tree house, a home woven from many uh, permanent and transient microbial inhabitants. And yet we have only very recently come to even notice this large number of underexplored and mostly nameless microorganisms that inhabit the human body. In fact, it was only in 2001 that Joshua Lederberg coined the term microbiome in order to, quote, signify the ecological community of commensal, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms that literally share our body space and have been all but ignored as determinants of health and disease. Now, this is rather remarkable, um, because these microbial communities perform essential major functions within their host bodies that include uh, various aspects of digestion, vitamin production and drug metabolism, uh, education of the immune system, and defense against pathogens. Um, but the microbiome can also be a source of infectious agents. Uh, for example, the oral microbiome is the natural reservoir for numerous respiratory opportunistic pathogens um, that are responsible for infections ranging from pneumonia to meningitis. And the oral and gut microbiomes have been implicated in several chronic inflammatory diseases, including uh, a cardiovascular disease, um, where in, in a recent study it was found that more than 80% of diseased valve and arterial tissues contain oral bacteria. So the microbiome clearly plays a pivotal role in human biology, and therefore it is critical to understand its evolution and changing ecology through time. And one way we can, we can do this is we can investigate the ancestral human microbiome by directly measuring and analyzing it from archaeological material. Now, ancient DNA studies have long focused on the analysis of bones and teeth. Um, and we've made major advancements studying these tissues. Um, and we've been able to, for example, recover host and pathogen DNA and reconstruct uh, the entire genomes of extinct animals, archaic humans, and, and even ancient pathogens. But studying the microbiome has been very challenging. The human body decays rapidly after death. In some cases, mummification can occur, but in the vast majority of instances, we are left with only a skeleton. But there is one microbiome that routinely persists after death, and that is something called dental calculus. This is a, it's what it essentially is, is a dental plaque that has spontaneously calcified during life. You know this by the name tartar, which is what your dentist calls it. Um, it calcifies during life in a way, it actually is the only part of your body that fossilizes while you're still alive, and therefore persists like your skeleton long after death. Um, this is just a close-up image of dental calculus, so you can kind of see what it is. Um, if you're wondering what this looks like in a living person, here's an image here. It's this calcified microbial matrix on the surface of teeth. Uh, this particular example is from a, a woman who died approximately 1,000 years ago. And we can, take a, we can zoom in on this particular tooth here, and here I've just shown that same tooth now in cross-section using scanning electron microscopy, and we can zoom in on this calculus deposit that you can see on the surface of the enamel. There it is right there, and we're gonna zoom in again on this part right here, and one of the things that's very clear immediately is that it has structure, it has a layered structure, um, and that is because dental calculus forms incrementally. Uh, dental plaque undergoes spontaneous calcification, which kills the microorganisms inside, but also entombs them. And then another layer of dental plaque forms, and this process repeats. And over time, it builds up layers like tree rings or layers of an onion. But what's really significant about this is what it means is that we have an ordered record of this person's life history from the earliest period, closest to the surface of the teeth, to, to the latest period of the life, just before they died. Um, this structure never remodels, and therefore is a remarkable record of this person's life history. We can zoom in even further and actually see the individual microbial cells that have been just calcified in situ. 
We can also decalcify it and, and use stains like gram stain to visualize these bacteria. Remarkably, when you remove the, the mineral, the, the bacteria do not disintegrate. And in fact, you can see individual microbial cells here. So these are individual gram-positive bacteria, for example, here, still with cell wall intact. And what to me was most remarkable is we tried kind of on a lark, we didn't think it would work. We decided to use another stain, um, in this case, Hooks dye, which is very similar to DOPI if you've ever used that. It's a DNA dye, it binds to double-stranded DNA. And this is the image we, ha we, we got after that, which you saw in the beginning. Um, this is the only archaeological material that I know to exist that has so much DNA inside that you can actually see it under a microscope. This property turns out to be pretty remarkable for calculus. Um, if we're going to use by comparison, let's just sort of talk a little bit about bone and dentin. Those are the tissues that are most commonly studied. Um, they actually have very little DNA inside, even when a person is alive. So bone, for example, has fewer than 1,000 cells per milligram. It's almost acellular. We have, typically in archaeological context, we recover very little DNA, typically less than a nanogram of DNA per milligram that we study. And even that is mostly environmental bacteria that have invaded post-mortem. So here's a, it's just some data that we've generated in my own lab. We looked at four teeth um, from different parts of the world, different time periods, and we looked to see what the endogenous content was of dentin. What we find is that only a tiny fraction of that DNA um, is actually human. Um, most of it, the vast majority, is, is uh, post-mortem environmental bacteria that are decomposing the teeth, and on average we get something like 0.1 to 8% human DNA. So very, very low amounts of endogenous DNA. Calculus is completely different. First off, it starts off with far more cells. So on average, it has more than 200 million cells per milligram. In our lab, we've isolated um, in excess of 500 nanograms of DNA per milligram we've studied. And what's also really remarkable is we have very low contamination from environmental sources. So these are these same teeth, but now we've analyzed the calculus from them, and what you can see is the endogenous content, the oral microbiome proportion, is much, much higher. It's on the order of 60 to 80 percent. We can look then at pairs, again, of calculus and dentin, and we can see that the amount of DNA that we can recover, this is a logarithmic scale, is on average about two orders of magnitude higher, so nearly 100 times more DNA in calculus than in dentin, um, and in some cases, 1,000 times higher. We thought for in the beginning this might just be because it starts off with more DNA, and so we decided to test this. We took a tooth that was very diseased. It had a massive carious lesion and also a giant abscess, so this would have had tons of bacterial DNA, tons of bacteria at the time this person died, and we expected that we might see elevated levels of DNA from these samples, and in fact, we don't. We find they're almost the same as what we see for healthy dentin. And it seems to imply that there's something special about calculus that facilitates DNA preservation. We can then actually go in and say, well, what, what do we find in calculus? This is this amazing uh, structure. Um, uh, it's full of DNA. What sorts of information can we learn from it? Well, we can break it down into different categories, and we can say, well, about 99% of it is bacterial. That makes sense. Uh, we know this is made of dental plaque. Dental plaque is primarily a, a microbial matrix. But about 1% is, is quite interesting. We have a little bit more than a half a percent, which is eukaryotic. That's mostly host and dietary. And we also find a tiny bit of archaea and a little bit of virus. Uh, the virus is actually bacteriophage, uh, which are viruses that infect um, bacteria. We can also extract proteins from uh, dental calculus, and we can also classify them. What we find is about 80% of the proteins are bacterial in origin, and about 20% are human. And I'll come back to that in just a few minutes. Let's focus on the bacteria first. Um, we've identified more than 1,000 species, um, but the vast majority, more than 85% of the sequences, that, uh, bacterial sequences that we find actually belong to 100 highly abundant taxa, and some of them are very interesting. So here's just a selection of some of the bacteria that we've uh, identified in dental calculus, ancient dental calculus. And I mentioned earlier that the oral microbiome is a major reservoir for opportunistic infections, and we find many of these bacteria preserved in dental calculus. Now, I want to caution here that finding them does not indicate this person had this disease while they were alive. Carriage of these organisms is quite widespread, even asymptomatic carriage. But these bacteria have the capacity to cause disease under the right circumstances, for example, if the host is immunocompromised. What's really significant about this is it gives us the opportunity to study the evolution of these opportunistic pathogens because they do not preserve in any other context. And some of them are very interesting. So, for example, Streptococcus pneumoniae uh, is a causative agent of pneumonia. Uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, that's one of the causes of strep throat. 
Um, Haemophilus influenzae causes respiratory infections, and Neisseria meningitidis is a leading cause of bacterial meningitis. Now we have a reliable source to study the evolution of these opportunistic pathogens. But a couple others that we found extremely interesting are these three, a little bit lesser known. We have here Porphyrmonas gingivalis, Tanner lefrosithia, and Treponema denticola. We have them at really high abundance. Um, and this is potentially clinically significant because these are the major causative agents of periodontal disease today. We investigated this a little further. We wanted to know, did our ancient samples have unusually high abundances of these three taxa? And so what we did is we compared it to a reference set of healthy individuals from the Human uh, Microbiome Project. We found that the frequency of these organisms within healthy individuals are vanishingly small. Um, very, very few uh, um, uh, copies of these bacteria are present in, in healthy people. But our ancient individuals had much higher frequencies of these bacteria. This did uh, make sense, however, because we'd actually selected these individuals for study because they showed osteological evidence for periodontal disease. But what was interesting about this is we were able to show that despite a century of intensive efforts uh, to prophylactically treat periodontal disease and prevent it, we still see the same organisms that are causing it over a span of more than 1,000 years. Now, one of these organisms, Tanarella forsythia, we actually found at such high abundance that we were able to reconstruct a full draft genome. And we're now investigating it to try to understand the evolution of this pathogen through time. In addition to the bacteria that are present, um, I mentioned before that we do find some really interesting other material there. Um, it turns out dental calculus, like dental plaque, acts as a kind of sink for other, all the other things that you put into your mouth, um, including host uh, biomolecules as well as food. And talk really quickly about the host. Early on, we noticed that we were seeing human DNA within dental calculus, and this was really interesting to us. We just published a study last month where, using a capture-based approach, we were able to um, enrich for human DNA and reconstruct full mitochondrial genomes, in this case from a, a, a cemetery of a Native American cemetery from Illinois. This is potentially actually quite impactful, especially in North America. There are many tribes who um, do not allow a genetic analysis of skeletal remains because it is a destructive process. But if dental calculus can serve as a surrogate, it may be a way of conducting ancient genetic analysis without uh, disturbing the actual skeletal remains themselves. We also find a huge abundance of human proteins within dental calculus, and this is where it gets extremely interesting. Most of these proteins, I've color-coded them by sort of what their function is. Most of these proteins are colored red, and that's because they are part of the innate immune system. What's interesting about this is that by having proteins, we get an additional level of information. We are not only identifying that we have human proteins, but many of these proteins are specifically expressed in different cell types. In this case, many of them are specific to neutrophils. So we can identify the source of these proteins as a specific um, immune cell that's reacting to dental calculus. And so what we've, we're actually visualizing here is evidence of an active infection at the time of death. Now, in terms of diet, it's long been known that microfossils, plant microfossils and animal microfossils preserve within dental calculus. So all that little bit of uh, bits of food that get stuck between your teeth, they actually stick around for a really long time and we can see them under the microscope. So what you're looking at here, this is a little bit of connective tissue from some sort of animal tissue this person ate. This is a phytolith, it's a little piece of plant glass. These two here are actually intact starch granules. This one, the morphology is consistent with the plant tribe Tritici, which includes things like wheat and barley. And this one has characteristic structures of the plant family Fabaceae, which includes things like peas and beans. We can also extract DNA from this and get even higher species level resolution. So this particular tooth um, came from um, a, a man who lived in Germany about 1,000 years ago. And in his teeth, we found evidence of sheep, pigs, cabbage, and wheat, and therefore conclusively demonstrated the German <laughs> diet has not changed much in more than 900 years. We can also isolate proteins from dental calculus to investigate diet. One of the most interesting ones that we have found so far is this one called beta-lactoglobulin. Beta-lactoglobulin is specific to milk, and as a result, we've now been able to test more than 100 individuals and identify the presence of dairy um, throughout Europe, dating back to at least the Bronze Age. We published these results last year. We're building on them now. Um, and our goal in the next phase of this project is to try to understand the origins and spread of daring um, in the Middle East and Europe. 
What's also amazing about proteins and using this approach is that because it's sequence-based, there are sequence variants that are species-specific, and we can actually distinguish cattle milk, sheep milk, and goat milk, and have a very fine-scale resolution of how, uh, how these dietary practices changed. So if you'll pardon my pun, I think we've only scratched the surface of where we can go with dental calculus analysis. And one of the most exciting things that I find about it is that is its ubiquity. So dental calculus is found in all, living, all known living populations today, and we find it uh, ubiquitously in skeletal assemblages from the past. It's also found on Neanderthal teeth and the teeth of Australopithecines. It's actually quite abundant on chimpanzee teeth as well. And I think by studying it, it can provide a unique window, a lens through which we can be better begin to understand uh, the evolution of our ancient microbial self. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank these people as well.